We want to welcome you back into the 53rd Avenue devotional cast. We're so glad that you are here uh, joining us from the baby bunker, uh, the Watson family baby bunker. Uh, and, and we're so thankful that you're here for episode 27 on Matthew 27. Uh, today is Wednesday. What a beautiful day uh, and what an opportunity to jump into God's word. And so uh, today as we, we begin, uh, I have to, uh, you know, just again echo what I've said multiple times already. We are just so appreciative of everything that, that everyone has been doing for us. And, and um, we are uh, humbled uh, by the outpouring of your love and your concern for us and, and, and our, our newborn son. Uh, and so again, thank you all so very much uh, for looking to our needs and continuing to, to lift us in prayer. And so again, um, thank you. Um, as we jump into God's word today together, I, I, I have to say that Matthew 27 is one of the most important passages of scripture um, that you can read probably. Um, it, it tells the story of Jesus' trial, crucifixion, and burial. Um, but that also makes it, in many ways, um, one of the most heart-wrenching and difficult passages of scripture that you could read. Um, and so uh, I'm going to do my best today. Um, it's sort of been hard for me to, to, to dwell on, on the way that um, God loved us so much that he sent Jesus, um, his one and only son, um, you know, just an hour ago I was holding my own son. Um, and so it's hard for me to fathom the, the, the depths of the love that God has for us. Um, and, and so in that spirit, I'm going to focus perhaps less on the, the passages directly telling the story of the crucifixion and the burial today, uh, and focus on some of the events surrounding, um, which I think are, are, are great lessons for us. Uh, as well. Um, near the beginning of the chapter in verse number three of Matthew 27, we see um, how Judas Iscariot's story comes to a close. And, and I want to look here for a moment, uh, picking up again in verse three. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. You know, I, I've thought a lot about Judas's choice and, and the decision he makes here. Obviously, we know that the initial decision he makes to betray Jesus, and um, I believe it's in the Gospel of John, we actually even see some of his earlier indiscretions with finances. He had uh, been kind of taking money here and there from um, the money that the, the disciples had. Uh, with them, and so he'd been kind of um, skimming or, or uh, off the top, if that makes sense. Um, and so he, he, he had a number of indiscretions, but I don't think that uh, any of them compare to his betrayal of Jesus. And so that has transpired at this point. Um, and, and I think he, in this passage, it's becoming clear to Judas the full weight of the decision he made. I'm not sure, and I don't know that the scriptures really bear out what he thought they were going to do with Jesus. Um, I, I, again, just knowing what he had, Jesus had claimed at this point, the authority that he was taking claim to, or laying claim to, excuse me. I don't know what Judas thought was going to happen. Um, and I'm not sure, again, that, that it can be fully known. But it's clear to me that once he saw the way things were progressing, that, that there was... A rec uh, he recognized um, that Jesus was condemned. He recognized uh, that that this was an, an, was wrong. That he had betrayed innocent blood, um, and, and so we see sort of a kernel of remorse, um, and definitely uh, a lot of the weight of uh, the consequence uh, to his sin. And I think about what he must have gone through in terms of the anguish that he would experience in that moment of realizing the weight of what he had done. Um, and I also think about, you know, I know that, you know, none of us are literally betraying Jesus this, in quite the same way that Judas did, but I know that sometimes people um, sin today and that uh, their sin leads to the death of another person, right? Um, perhaps through negligence or, or even, heaven forbid, uh, substance use, sometimes people get behind the wheel of a car um, and uh, through through that act, end up taking the life of another person. Um, and I can't imagine the, the weight of that guilt. Um, I'm blessed that, that my, my sin has 
caused the most struggle for me and, and, and has not cost the life of someone else. And yet, you know, I think about a person who's experienced some, the guilt and remorse um, that may come with an act like that. Um, and I want to be really clear today. I, I, I think it's clear that if Ju Judas, even in this moment, even as he looked at, at a condemned Savior, for whom he was at least in, in part responsible for that condemnation, there would have been forgiveness for Judas if he had pursued it. Um, that is not to say that the earthly consequences of his choice weren't still going to happen. right? Um, the betrayal led to, again, at least in part, the crucifixion of Jesus. And so Judas was guilty. And he couldn't take back, even though, again, here he tried to return the money and tried to do what he could, he could not take back the earthly consequences. And that's true for our actions, too. And yet, there would have been forgiveness for Judas had he pursued it. The same way that no matter what we have done, there is forgiveness for us through Jesus. That is the spirit of the good news of Jesus. And so, I, I want you to know that he was never beyond forgiveness. Um, and you are never so far gone that you can't come back to God as well. But I also want to be really clear. Um, you know, if you feel overwhelmed by the weight of your sin or the condition of your life, um, I want to be clear. My training is in mental health. Uh, suicide is never the answer. Um, it wasn't the answer then. It isn't the answer now. It is never the answer. Um, if you have struggled either through, again, consequence of sin or, or frankly, just mental health challenges, right? Chemical imbalances and other things that may cause you uh, to question whether life is worth living. And I want, you to, I want you to know that it is so worth it. And that if you are struggling in that moment right now, um, that, that I want to encourage you to get help. Or if someone you love is struggling with this, get help. Um, one of the easiest things that you can do um, is commit this short phone number to memory. Um, that number is 211. Um, if you call 211, they offer a number of different services they, they, um, from, from emergency financial services and, and different things like that. Um, but one of the services they offer is they will connect you with mental health professionals, whether that's the suicide hotline or uh, another type of mental health service that you may require. Uh, 211. It's much easier to remember than a number of the, the hotlines, but again, they will get you in touch. In fact, in the year 2018, um, the, the operators at 211 helped 150,000 people who were struggling with thoughts of suicide get the help that they needed, and almost a, a million in total that were struggling with mental health to get in touch with the resources that they needed. And so I want to be really, really clear. No matter where you may find yourself, no matter what you may have done, suicide is never the answer. Get the help that you need. Uh, and, and I pray that, that un, unlike Judas' story that ended so tragically, um, that yours can end with a beautiful resolution and a life for God. Uh, and so that's my hope and prayer for you today. I want to quickly um, look a little bit further uh, at, at, at a story um, of the crowd in Barabbas. Uh, and so we'll try to do this quickly. Um, this is verse 15 is where we're going next, and I want to read for you for a little bit. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. I'm going to jump to verse 20. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. You know, I, I see in this story... You know, I, I, I've often focused on Barabbas in this passage, right? And he's kind of the one I focused on. But I want to focus for a minute on, on the crowd. Um, because I know it, uh, in many situations in our lives, we find ourselves amongst the crowd. 
that, uh, you know, whether it's at a concert or a sporting event or just at a social gathering, that, that there's a group of people around us. And, and the fact is, is we talk to our teens and our children a lot about peer pressure. But I would say that it's important for us to remind ourselves as adults that we are not immune to those pressures. Um, you know, many of those that were in this crowd at that time uh, were some of the ones that were in the crowd as Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem. You know, they went from shouting Hosanna to shouting crucify him. And there's a couple things that we ought to remember. Number one, um, as much as we don't like to admit it, almost every single one of us, in fact, probably virtually all of us, are impacted in some way by those we surround ourselves with, for good or for bad, right? Uh, we rub off on each other, right? Uh, and so we are all impacted by that. But secondarily, we're also all impacted by the influence of authority, right? It's it's clear in verse 20 that, that those that were religious authorities were, were actively working to convince this crowd to shout crucify, to crucify Jesus and to release Barabbas. Um, again, my training in mental health, psychological study after psychological study has shown that people are manipulated and influenced when an authority figure asks them to do something. It, that, that's, it, it works. It's the idea of what we call a power relationship. And without getting into the science of it, I just want to make it really clear that authority figures are often able to manipulate generally moral people into committing heinous acts if they want to. Um, and, and so that's a message for us to be paying attention to when we may be manipulated as this crowd was. But it's also a, a responsibility for those of us that find ourselves in authority positions at times to recognize that that comes with a greater responsibility because people are listening. People are following after the things that you say and do. And so consider those things um, because clearly um, this crowd was not absolved of responsibility. You know, the weight of Jesus' blood was on them as much as it was on the Roman soldiers, as much as it was on Judas, as much as it was on anyone. Uh, and so they were responsible for their actions, even though those authority figures had tried to convince them to follow the wrong way and, and unfortunately had succeeded in doing so. And so as we wrap this time together, I know this has been some heavy stuff, um, and, and I, I just want to reiterate a couple things. If you were a loved one or struggling with, with thoughts of suicide, please get help. Call 211, call the suicide hotline, um, get in touch with someone who is a professional that can help you. Okay. Secondarily, guide your steps. Pay attention to who's influencing you and who you are influencing. Um, because, again, we are all going to be responsible for our actions before the Lord someday. Uh, and I hope and pray that we have used our influence and that we have done those things which are right in the sight of God. Let's close with a word of prayer today. Father God, I just thank you so much for this this opportunity to get into your word. And Father, uh, as we look at such a, um, a devastating chapter um, that led to the death and the burial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Father, I know even in, in this, there are lessons for us of how our conduct should be, how we should live. Father, the mistakes that we can, I pray that we can avoid in this life. But Father, as I think about this great act of sacrifice, I am just so thankful that you loved us enough to send Jesus that no matter what we have done in this life, that grace can still be something that we can obtain. That forgiveness is, is, is right at our door. That the love that you have for us shines into the darkness that so often tries to, to just blind us um, in this life. Father, I am so thankful for you. Father, I pray as well that just uh, if there's anyone that's struggling today um, with health, and especially as we've talked about mental health, Father, I just pray that you would grant healing for them. Father, give them the avenue to um, receive the help that they need. And Father, help us to, to facilitate that contact if need be. Father, we thank you um, that you are the great healer, the great physician. Father, we pray that you would protect people from coronavirus at this time. And Father, be with those that are currently battling for their lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, tomorrow Lon's going to be with you to wrap up Matthew, the, the book of Matthew, as it comes to a close. Um, and, and again, we just hope and pray that um, everything is going well for you. God bless, grace, and peace, and we'll see you soon.